Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the April 26, 2022 meeting of the Avalon County Planning Commission. Um, I'm sorry, was there, a, I'm gonna borrow my cheat sheet from my colleague here. Uh, we, we have moved to a hybrid version so that there are opportunities for people to be able to comment remotely. So we will be using this going forward, which is a great innovation. So the opportunities for the public to access and participate in the hybrid meeting are posted on the Albemarle County website, on the Planning Commission homepage, and on the Albemarle County calendar. Participation will include the opportunity to comment on those matters for which comments from the public will be received. I'd like to call this meeting to order, and if you would call the roll, please. Yes. Mr. Bailey. Present. Mr. Missile. Present. Here. Ms. Firehawk. Here. Mr. Carazana. Here. Mr. Bivens. Here. Mr. Claiborne. Here. Thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna move on to the work session. Uh, we have a work session on setback and land uses this evening and Bill Fritz is going to present this at the beginning. Thank you. There. And thank you for taking time tonight, today afternoon, I guess. It's not quite tonight. Um, first time back for me and what, two and a half years. I thought of, I was telling them, I thought about wearing a box so you could just see that much of me so it would look familiar. But uh, it was a lot of work, so I didn't do it. <laughs> so um, what we're here tonight is this is just a, this is a, a work session for the uh, setbacks and land uses. I have a presentation. I'll go through it. it. It it's more if you have it's more to help you with the things you already have in your in your uh, packet. So uh, what are we doing? Uh, the Board of Supervisors has tasked the Community Development Department with updating and modernizing the zoning ordinance. Um, as you all know, the zoning ordinance was originally adopted in 1980 and has been amended over the years. And when you do that, it starts getting a little disjointed and some of the things there are a little dated. Uh, so we're trying to modernize it, trying to make it easier to, to use, more user-friendly. So uh, this is a multi-step project. Um, the uh, board has uh, graciously funded the hiring consultant to do this work. We're starting with the setbacks, step backs and land uses. We've hired the Berkeley group. We have two representatives here, Kelly Davis, Chris Musso. I did pronounce that correct, didn't I? <laughs> and, um, huh? Oh, Rebecca Cobb, yes. I, I, I looked right at her and did the wrong name. Sorry, Rebecca. Yes, um, Rebecca and Chris. Um, uh, they have experience working with a lot of localities in Virginia. They work pretty much, ex I think, exclusively in Virginia, uh, and they've worked with a lot of our localities. Uh, that gives them the advantage and gives us the advantage of having hired them to uh, be working with a, a company that has written ordinances for a number of other localities. So they have a lot of experience doing this. So one of the things they did, obviously, in addition to their own uh, experiences, they surveyed other uh, localities to develop, uh, to see what the best practices were. So the purpose tonight is to discuss the step backs, set, step backs, setbacks, and land uses. This is just a work session. All the language has not been ironed out yet. So uh, we're trying to get a feel, are we heading in the right direction? And then ultimately we'll come back with a, uh, a public hearing. So uh, what are we doing? So first though, we're talking about the step backs. And I just pulled a section from the zoning ordinance, and this is what step backs are. And what it does is it requires the um, upper floors uh, to be stepped back. This creates a, a, a weird architectural problem, engineering problem, of where your bearing walls are. It has also been the number of numerous and repeated uh, special exceptions. I'm not aware of any special exceptions having been denied by the Board of Supervisors. So when you're routinely granting special exceptions, it's probably time to, to amend your ordinance. So we're recommending that the step back regulation just be eliminated. <clears throat> so uh, I do have slides for each of the, the setbacks for the districts. Um, I can go through each one of those with you if you want. You have them in your packet. Um, just to briefly outline what they do, um, the, um, um, 
excuse me, one of the things that we're doing is with infill. Um, just talk about infill first. The, the infill regulations are, I didn't copy them, sorry. The infill regulations are a little bit difficult. You have to go and figure out where the, the, the dwellings are within 500 feet in either direction. You're trying to find what the average is and you're, you're trying to match what the development already was. We, we think we have an easier way of doing that. And that would be to say, you can use either the setback regulations in effect at the time you apply for a building permit or the setback regulations that were shown on the subdivision plat that approved the subdivision because that would be what the subdivision was built to largely. So that would be an easier way, we think. If it's a development that precedes uh, the recordation of an approved subdivision plat, they could apply for a special exception so they would have relief there. So we think that would be a much easier way of doing it and would be uh, matching how uh, development had already occurred. For each of the districts, <clears throat> Uh, for, for each of the districts, the concept is to uh, graduate setbacks based on lot size and density. That's how other jurisdictions have done this. We, see, we are not proposing any changes in the rural areas, Monticello Historic District, Village Residential District, or the DCD District. In the R1, R2, and R4 districts, um, there is an increase in the front, side, and rear setback that's proposed. Uh, this information is in your packet. I have it here in case you wanted to see it, but there is a, a recommendation to, to, uh, to increase those setbacks. In the R6 district, there's an increase in the front setback. In the R10 and the R15 districts, there is no change. In the commercial districts, there's an increase in the front and rear. In the industrial, there's an increase in the front side and rear. Both the commercial districts and the industrial districts have currently and would maintain increased setbacks when they're adjacent to non-commercial, non-industrial properties. In the plan districts, what we're recommending, and we, we haven't quite figured out how to do this yet, but in plan districts, we think it would be appropriate to, to have setbacks for those districts. Uh, and if someone wanted relief from those setbacks, they could request that at the time of the rezoning of the establishment of the plan district. What we have now is a situation where every single time we have a planned district, we're essentially writing a new zoning ordinance for it and it becomes very difficult to administer. You have to, oh wait, is this the new section of that development or the old section of that development? And wait, this development across the street has an altogether different uh, setback. Uh, so we're trying to, to, to make it more uniform. Um, with land use definitions, as I said, the ordinance was originally adopted in 1980. We've done some work to, to try to uh, bring it up to date, uh, but there's still a lot of outdated uh, land uses that are in there. Uh, some of those are overlapping and confusing. Is it this, is it that kind of thing? And there are some uses that just aren't listed in our ordinance. So uh, what we're proposing to do is move to a matrix concept um, where we would broaden the terms, modernize the terms, and consolidate. So there actually be fewer total definitions. And uh, there'd be a matrix where you, so you look at the list of uses and then it would tell you what districts it is versus how you do now where you have to look at each district to see whether or not a use is permitted. So you could say, my business is X, where can I go? You would be able to look at the matrix versus my use is X, do I need highway commercial? Do I need C1? Do I need, you have to go look at each one of those districts. We think that'd be a whole lot easier to do. Um, there's going to have to be some work here to make sure we match up the districts and we're not expanding uses in, uh, unwittingly uh, from one district to the other. Uh, we're also, we know we'll have to change the supplemental regulations to, to match. Um, those are all mechanical things. There's no policy change there. We just know that as we change one place, you have to catch up with it in other places in the ordinance. We also know that there are some uses that are just so unique in character uh, to Albemarle County or because of 
the, what the comprehensive plan says about that use that we just can't really do anything with them. For example, country stores, they're very specific. They're not small stores. We had a lot of conversations about that. Are they small stores? Are they retail stores? No, they're country stores. They're their own special thing. Uh, same with some uh, uses, retail stores, eating establishments, automobile service stations, uh, not served by public water. It's a very specific thing because of the comprehensive plan. And then uh, we also have Monticello, nobody else does. So we can't compare that with anyone else. So the Monticello Historic District needs to just be treated as its own unique thing. That's sort of the summary of what we're doing. I can answer questions. Uh, Rebecca, not Kelly, can, uh, and Chris can uh, uh, answer questions for you also. They've done the research on this and uh, can tell you how this matches with other localities and why we're recommending what we're recommending or I can try to answer questions for you at this point. <clears throat> questions for staff? Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. You mentioned, so my question kind of relates to like, when we think about what we're trying to do now in Mark County is keep a, a sense of, a, Commissioner Biven says a lot, human skill, you know, so, and, and balance our rural assets with development. And I would like to understand a little bit about these five benchmark counties, because I know there's reference one about having a 12 story building. And to me, set, setbacks and step backs have to do with trying to maintain human skill. And I'm struggling a little bit of understanding like, and one recommendation was to, we, we have a substantially lower setback, but are the reference is that for an R6, but do we have, you know, uh, is that, I guess what I'm struggling with is like, What's the equivalency for why they have a bigger step back, setback in some of these other counties that maybe they don't have as much R6 and is R6 the maximum? And so I'm trying to just kind of figure out the relationship of the setback to the size of the structure that we likely would have now in Mark County versus some of these reference counties. So uh, let me answer part of the question and then I'm going to have to turn over to Berkeley for part of the question. Uh, so why the jurisdictions that were looked at? Uh, staff, we got together and we, we said, which jurisdictions have we used as benchmark jurisdictions previously? Uh, which ones are sort of known in the state for having um, um, good ordinances or things that we are, have been trying to emulate? And we've done that with a wide variety of things. Uh, from our, what is our healthcare program going to be to what is our land use is going to be. So we, we've we done benchmarks before. And so we gave those names to uh, the, the Berkeley group. As for what each jurisdiction has, they've done more work in that and, and so forth. And I don't know if you wanna provide some comment there. Hello. So to answer that, Part of the question, um, these localities have lots of districts that we had to weed through. And what we would do would be look at those intent statements and compare them to the intent statements of our Merle, look at their lot sizes, their density for those districts and compare it to our Merle. And so when those lined up and meshed, we would then look at setbacks. And then two, in terms of looking at all the benchmarks together, because in some of the districts, the intent statements, of course, might be slightly different um, or density might be slightly different. Um, but then when you look at the setbacks compared to the others that we were also looking at, we could see, yeah, these all kind of match together and, and they stand apart from what Albemarle has. So how do we need to adjust? That's how we approach that. Thanks. I appreciate that. That's helpful. I guess the thing I'm left with of trying to get a, a picture of, you know, recommendation of sizes is, and the question is, is an R6 the same in land use planning as a larger metropolitan area as R6 in the sense of a step down of massing, you know, is R6 for Charlottesville and Alamal County area. Charlottesville is even different than Alamal County, but Alamal County, where we're doing this, is R6 really the higher density. And so should we think about setbacks differently for that size of a structure right. versus bigger? And so that's where I'm left trying to read through this and do that mapping in this document, which I, I wasn't able to really do without doing more research on my own to figure out what, what do we see as being the different densities and, and forms of that building and what should that be to achieve the type of fill and human scale that we're trying to do. So 
So that's part of it as well. You mentioned the 12 story building that was pulled out of, of a different district than like R6 or any of those. It, it was a separate district. And, and actually that relates to an overlay that that particular community have. And that's where they use those step backs. So that was why that was pulled out as an example is, hey, this is 12 story building. This is, you know, along a specific corridor to protect it. And that's why they're using this. I just wanted to put that in there to explain Yes, some localities do have this, but here's the scenario, which doesn't really match Albemarle. But in all other terms, um, yes, we pick districts that would match what Albemarle is trying to achieve and, and build. For sure. I think that's, and maybe I missed it, but even just knowing what, per that, what was the maximum size building they were able to build for that density in that area might help understand the justification for the setback that they recommended and how that may map to our max height versus density requirements. Um, I'm, I'm gonna look to my colleague over here. He might have some of those pulled up and we can talk about those heights if you want. I, if I'm you just want registering to... it. We don't have to detail, but it's just registering the things that are going through Matt as a work session of trying to make sense of these numbers. And to me, a setback and a step back <clears> is to maintain a certain fill and a step, you know, and human scale. And we have that, that's, very important, I think, to us as a planning commission. And so when we have these reference, which I get why we pick them as reference counties, because they're large, they're usually larger, they have more staff, they're better funded, so they have better ordinances and they lead the way. Um, and that's great, we should do that. It's just trying to do that kind of standardization. I'm a data scientist, I'm not a land planner by, so I think on data, it's like, how do we, how do we create apples to apples comparison that the, the max height is allowed to be this for this designation in this county, which is why that setback was kind of felt so that when you're walking down the street, you don't feel like you're, it's caving in on top of you. Um, and so that's what I think we're trying to achieve here is we think through this and weed through this, these recommendations of what's the right setback to achieve something. And granted, I think we're all for making it easier to understand and, and simplify it, but you know, I, I don't know that I have enough information right now from what I read to be like, oh yeah, that sounds like the right setback for that um, based on what we're trying to achieve. So that's just where I'm at with it. So no, no need to respond. I think this is great work and I appreciate it. I'm just left, left with trying to do that match up in my head. Well, if I may, I, I, our role tonight is to, if this is sort of a first pass, if you will. And if there are things that strike you as like, you need more information to understand how to judge that yeah. element, that's, this is the time to say that. But it's also fine to say, you know, I don't, I don't think that that's the right approach for this particular element uh, because they need our guidance so they can move on to, to complete it. So I know I had a couple of concerns um, that I found in here. Um, so it's, it's not to just like understand and then they move forward. It's, you know, I'll give them some guidance so that, um, they can get it as close to what this planning commission would like to see as possible. So with that, I, I see. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. I so I think I've please. taken up air, enough air space. And <laughs> That's okay. um, other, I mean, I can go later. Other comments, Fred. I have, a, I have a couple of quick comments. Thanks for your work. This is really well done. Just a few thoughts. One is thoughts and questions, I guess. And I'll just piggyback on, I think a little bit of what Daniel was saying relative to step backs. So um, I'm just curious, I know step backs in the past have also been used to sort of help with sun angles so you don't shade the street. And I'm wondering if, you know, this is a little bit forward thinking, I guess, when density starts to get greater or maybe in a town center. But um, have you looked at, maybe I should rephrase it, I would encourage you to look at impacts on shading of streets if you haven't already done that. I also noticed that you had mitigating in there, I think it was one foot step back or, or additional setback for every one foot of additional building height. And if you think like a developer, right, building height is translates into more capacity, more density. So uh, I would just look at if you're, if you're thinking about, I'm just making these numbers up, but if you're looking at a four story building and you have zero step backs and you decide to go up another 15 feet to add another floor, you then have to step back five stories, 15 feet. And so that's more of an impact to the potential capacity of that building that the developer might be willing or might be interested in looking at. So you may have already compared all of those things, but I just check on it. 
Um, other quick comment is relative to the benchmarks. I think they were pretty appropriate. I guess I would be interested to know um, if, first of all, and you don't have to answer this now, but were you directly involved with any of the ordinances for any of those localities? And if so, or if not, when you were doing your research, did you uncover anything they wish they had done differently? That um, So rather than just taking it rote that this is where they are and this is what we would decipher, did, were there any things that stood out as, gosh, I wish we really hadn't done that and we can learn from that? That'd be interesting to know. Um, let's see. I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, you, you can have another turn too. Thank you. <laughs> I reserve or uh, no, I uh, reserve another term. <laughs> Julian, did you have a comment? I did. Yeah. I, did. I see a lot of scribbles on his paper. Yeah, that, you know, that part of the scribbles is that um, it's just how I get through stuff. So I want to just make one sort of broad statement about Monticello is unique to to Albemarle County, and people know my drill on this. Each one of these districts has has a historic home. They have historic properties in them. Several of them have even a greater inventory of historic property. So let's segregate out the fact that Jefferson built that one. So the fact that to ask this sort of a, a question that I hopefully will get to at some point, what is the, how are we allowing the county's development efforts to be curtailed because we give an extra or what it feels like a governmental, a governmental oversight to a piece of property? So people, this is no, not, there's no, I'm not hiding anything here. I've been asking for a long time, why do we allow a non-governmental uh, entity to control how we develop our land? So that's why, so, so my piece about saying to, saying to us that Monticello is unique, I'm gonna challenge you that every single one of these counties here has historic properties. Some of them that actually are older than the property on the hill. So I would expect for you to go sort of to do your homework on that one. The other thing that, 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 I, that I, I struggled with, our supervisors are not want to increase our development area. They've got us at 5%, at 5%, at 5%. And so by increasing these setbacks, and the development area, the R1 through sixes, you basically reduce the amount of land that can be developed. I personally cannot support that. Now, my colleagues who live in the rural, I actually do live in the rural part of the county, but my colleagues who truly live in the rural part of the county. Uber rural. <laughs> Uber rural. Yeah, Uber rural. Um, there's very little or, or little if any impact on the, on, on the areas in which that's around them. But in the developed area, which is where you're going to see sort of the four, the future sort of uh, the future for R ones, R twos, R threes, and all, all the way up to R six, I'm going to struggle mightily with reducing and changing that dramatically. Now, perhaps there's a way to make that sort of more unified to get to the piece that you're talking about of not having that, and not having that be a, a, a difficult piece, and say these here will be this, and these will be that. And then you sort of do it as a binary solution if that's possible and then use the commercial light industry differently. I can understand that. But, but sort of separating out, separating out the one through six, I have a problem with. The other thing before we get to, I have a question we're gonna think on page 24, 24. You have a line, I, I think this is just an editor, an editor thing. You says, this use is proposed, dwelling, town, dwelling common townhouse. This use is proposed to consolidate attached single family dwellings and semi-detached and attached semi-family dwellings. I think either we need to drop the third attached or we need to give me a different housing type. Because if in reading that, it feels like we're talking about the same thing. I'll let you, I, you know, since this is a draft, I'll let you do that. Then my other question comes to, what do you want us to do with the proposed uses and definition? That could be a work session yeah, all into true. itself. I remember, um, uh, Oh, I always, she always looks at me sternly. Ms. Bloomfield, Bloomfeld, because I always get her first name wrong. Because <laughs> I want to say it's Leah, but it's Leah, and I, you know, that's just my own sort of blockheadedness. She, when she came to us uh, a, a couple of years ago, we spent, it felt like weeks on definitions. I've got so much green ink in here. 
that I could spend at least two days talking about the definitions and why are we going to some of those definitions? So on that, um, the, con the question we would like to get from you today is, do you believe there is value in trying to consolidate and, and, and reduce the total number of definitions and going to a matrix concept okay. uh, versus the exact language that you have in any particular okay. definition? So I would be one that would say, yes, I think there's some value in sitting with that. But I also noticed that it, when we look at the performance standards, and I couldn't figure out how to, how to marry that with a land use met matrix, but assume that that would be another problem. This, it very quickly got, uh, it, it, it got a lot of tentacles going and it, it became even more difficult okay. to understand. So we sort of tried to, we, we tried to consolidate <laughs> just like with the definitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah of I, I get it. So focusing down. Uh, if, if uh, Commissioner Bivens, if I could, uh, well, um, before we get too far along sure. on the, uh, the, the, the setback issue, uh, one of the things we can do is we can go back and look and see what the densities have been with the different setbacks that the county has had. One of the things that we're also concerned about is the concept that reduced setbacks are not changing the density. We're still getting the same density. You're simply getting larger structures and greater floor area ratios. And that this increased setbacks may not reduce the density but they do provide, may provide for smaller houses because the density is still going to be maintained. You still have four units per acre, for example, but you can't have the same amount of building coverage in that four acres because you have to build it within a smaller setback. It may mean you can't have a single story. You may have to have two, two floors, but uh, one of the things that we're looking at there is it also having uh, a difference in the floor area ratio on each individual lot uh, and just, wanted to to give you that and see if you had any comments so let that. me give you some pushback on that immediately then so i don't know necessarily and this is something that i would ask you to wrestle with the, with the supervisors but certainly if you're going to wrestle with me on this i don't necessarily notice that the code should be the thing that determines how a house is built so i don't know that the code should be the place where we say you can have a 1600 square foot or a, or a 4,000 square foot okay. i think that's a that's a market decision personally I also noticed there was an excellent article in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was yesterday, that people are making very specific decisions on how they want their houses to be because many of them aren't going back to offices and they're having to accommodate a different lifestyle in the thing that used to be only the place that they went at the end of the day, where everybody sort of gathered at the end of the day. And we also know that Albemarle is one of those places that people are wanting to gather too. So before I would sort of say, let's, 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 let's shrink the, um, or let's increase, I guess, let's use the proper term, let's increase the, um, the setbacks, I would actually say, let's let the market make that decision. Um, and because I think we're also seeing something here, as we become a community that people may age out in, they might want to have a garden but have a 1600 square foot house or have an 800 square foot house. I remember the piece that we saw, I don't remember the developer's name now, but on route 20 where she was trying to put uh, uh, small houses. Nicole Scrow. Thank you. I gave her some foolishness because she was saying they were gonna be inexpensive and all of us who have stayed in any kind of up, up scare, uh, upscale hotels know that you can make a 300 square foot um, hotel room as expensive as a, you know, as, as some of our homes to live in. So that was, a, you know, we always pre, pre some of these things. But what I'm, what I'm saying here is that I think, and Echo Village is another one where there mm -hmm. where, Village, is, yeah. it, is it Echo Village? Yeah. Where Echo Village is another place where I think lifestyles are changing. And so I may not want a big house, but I do want a big piece of property that I can wander around on. So I would just caution us, and in, in, which I think you're right, in, in making that decision that a setback helps to sort of send signals to the development community that this is the, this is the number of square feet here. And my sense is that the development community and, and mortgage rates make that decision as opposed to our ordinances. And now I will be quiet. But let me, I don't know if you wanna to respond to that, you don't necessarily need to, but since we only have this one hour work session, so we don't sort of, have, to me, have enough time to go through all of the things and then summarize whether we all agree. Sorry, I got loud. Um, <laughs> I, I would suggest that if you disagree with something another commissioner says, or you want to put a finer point on it, that you speak up. And that way, we won't have to have a summary that, yes, we agree with what Julian said, or yes, we agree with what you said, if that's okay. 
All right, so um, you're done for now. I'm for done now. for now. Luis. Uh, thank you, and I wanna thank staff and the Berkeley group. I, so, so I found it pretty easy to go through this document, which is, which is great. And so I do appreciate the way you, you put it together. I have a lot of the same um, concerns. So I'm not gonna reiterate that. I'm gonna try to hit them some new ones and then maybe highlight some of the ones that I think are, are uh, pretty uh, critical, um, at least in my view. So you mentioned, I'm in page two <laughs> and I'm not gonna start there and go every single page, but page two. <laughs> of, um, of, which, you, of which document, you, just so I know. Oh, I'm sorry, of, 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 your, of your phase one diagnostic okay. uh, report. Um, and structure is mentioned, and I would agree <clears throat> there is some challenges with our current structure. The, the way that it's mentioned is that it's not part of their initial phase, uh, but, that it, but that it is important. I'm assuming that it is being addressed. And I just, so that's just a question that you are addressing the structure uh, along with it. And I, and, I, and I think that is, that alone, I think is a real positive uh, because it, there are some challenges when you go through there and try to find your way. Uh, particularly if somebody is not, you know, just kind of doing it. So I think it's very user-friendly. It is not user-friendly and the recommendations would seem to be, I mean, I think the proof is in the pudding, but- We may not be able to get to it to, to, we, towards the end, but yes, we are with an eye towards right. doing that. Yes. That's, so that, that's great. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try not to be repetitive, uh, <laughs> Chair. It's okay. Uh, yeah. So, so we talk about uh, minimum and maximums and re removing the maximum, which, which I agree with. Uh, I think it goes back to, to the, the point that Commissioner Bivens was, was raising in terms of increasing our uh, setbacks. So once you increase those setbacks for the lower, for the R1 through R6, uh, well, I guess R6 is a, is a, a 15, but um, once you increase those setbacks, uh, and you don't have any, any maximum, uh, you are limiting uh, to some degree, right? And so I guess the question I have is what were you seeing as the benefit for that increase? Was there a driver that got us to why we go from, from, from five to 35? We have, there, there are a couple of things there, um, and I'm gonna to try, to, try to do this quickly. Uh, there are a couple of things there. One thing we're looking at is we're looking at the um, location of the driveway overhangs. We have a great deal of trouble with that, uh, interfering with sidewalks. Uh, that's, that's been a problem with, for us. We have the reduction, which is bringing everything closer to the street and losing some of that street scale that we were looking at. Also looking at what the climate action plan talks about in terms of heat island effect uh, and the uh, stormwater impacts of having the, that large floor area ratio. Uh, and by having these increased setbacks, you're going to have that benefit also of, of more green area within your development area. So I think some of that would be important in here. We, we'll we add it, we'll, we'll, and we'll consider it and expand Some of that on context it. of mm -hmm. why, why um, yeah, this was given without context and we, we right. should have given that. Yes. And, and to the same point, I, the, 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 I had a similar um, um, question about the counties that we were using as our benchmark. And again, I think what I'm missing there is, is, is the context. Um, I think Commissioner <laughs> Bailey was, was alluding to that and when we look at it, ours is, you know, we're different than a lot of these counties in, in many ways, but it's hard for us to understand why that is without understanding all the other parameters that are involved in those counties. And so that would be very important in, uh, in how we look at this and understand it. Um, the, the step back issue is another one that I, I, I agree um, uh, with Commissioner Missile on it, so there so there are some challenges with that. I I don't quite follow the 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 code or or architectural structure issue. I mean, I it, you know um, post and beam construction. There is no bearing walls when you're going up, so that goes away. Um, I think it's it's 
it is an architectural issue um, if you have all your buildings looking like a ziggurat, right? So yeah. at some point yeah. you want to minimize that. However, it is it is one strategy that we can use to minimize scale and to provide that that more human scale to to some of these areas. Th that's been said. I'm not going to dwell on that, but I, I do think that's something that we need to take a look at that. And I do not understand the the uh, the trade off in uh, setback, the one for one. Uh, that could be a. I think the 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 result of that would not be a pleasant streetscape. If every building is off by two or three or four feet in height, they're going to be off two or three or four feet in in their setbacks. So I think think about that a little bit more. What the ramifications might be. My last point, which is a new one, um, um, is is having to do with special districts. I, I was trying to reconcile and think about um, our form form um, form based code or form based planning approach, uh, RIO 29. So how does something like that work with these setbacks? Are we then creating, a, you know, like Crozet, you, you, you point that out as a, as a separate. So are we going to wind up with a bunch of little separate districts throughout the... We're still, we're still experimenting with the form-based code, like right. a lot of jurisdictions. And so it's really going to have to be its own, own thing, very much like DCD is. Yeah, so I, so I guess that's something that I would wonder is how that then, what are the implications of, of that to, to, um, to what we're doing here now? Yeah, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have to pull it in. That's it. <laughs> All right, take care. I don't have much that Louis just stole my thunder. I jotted oh, down man. RIO 29 form-based code and just how, <laughs> how those things coordinate. And so I don't have to repeat that. Um, just to just say the DCD is kind of, it was a start at a form-based code many years ago. So we learned some things there. So I think the form-based code is going to have to kind of go the same route as the DCD. So sorry. Sure. And just, and I'll just plus one on the, um, the step back piece, as I think about, you know, I, I jotted down some of the setbacks. C1 was 10 foot, HC was 10 foot. And I think about walking down West Main Street in Charlottesville, where you have hotels and larger buildings yeah. fronting up against a street with similar setbacks. Taking away that step back, just, to me, it doesn't feel good, you know, initially. So give that some more thought with those tighter setbacks that you have. Um, I feel like that might not be the, the best approach is to eliminate the step back altogether. So, um, this is the feedback we needed. Yep. Okay. Well, and I will I'll tag on to that. That was one of my comments as well. I you mentioned the fact that we had for I always get step backs. Uh, and there would be a number of them that we had uh, recently granted a waiver for. And I re recall the last three. And it was particularly well in a, in one or more cases. It was because it was a hotel, and so they would kind of lose the whole side of the rooms on one side, but. It was also because of the context of where they sat. None of, none of those were sitting right up against a pedestrian sidewalk where you would get that cavernous feeling. None of them were challenged by the problems of light and air and sun. And, you know, so that's why. And so I feel like there, I know it's hard, but that's why I have these excellent consultants is to figure out in which cases we want to retain those step backs because I do agree that um, we're trying to look for a more urban form in our development area. And in reading this, just, you know, I'm not going to go page by page because there was a lot here, but it, it felt like we were kind of going back a little bit to more of a suburban model at the same time we're trying to do this urban ring. And you mentioned that, you know, we have the form based code at RIO and we've got Crozet. And, and I felt ever since I joined this commission, um, I don't know, five years ago, whatever it was, that uh, there's a lot lacking because in, in our code, because we're building a city around a city. That's what we're trying to do essentially, but we're a county. So there are some things we can't do as a county that cities can do, but you know, I think that there's a lot more that needs to be done to, to recognize that we're trying to create more of an urban forum. And so some of, you know, I'm, I'm actually not for, uh, some of those expanded setbacks from the road. 
Uh, I would, you know, I grew up in a front porch community where your porches were just close enough, but not too close. You know, you couldn't see what somebody was drinking out of their glass, but you could, you know, say, hello, Mrs. So-and-so, and how are you? And you kids get out of that yard. You know, I, I just think, well, you know, the, the sort of community spirit and you can see and you can be part of your neighborhood, whereas some of those neighborhoods where the house is way back there and, you, you know, you don't talk to your neighbors when you're walking the dog because you can't even tell who it is walking the dog. Um, you know, if somebody wants to live in that type of a neighborhood, wonderful, good for them. But I think that for what we're trying to build in the urban ring, um, I didn't find that the comparisons of the counties that we're looking at necessarily provide the best model. Um, and I'll use an example from uh, a recent uh, webinar that was being hosted yesterday about rural roads and how great they were. And I was invited to join this webinar. And I said, well, I could join that webinar, but I feel like Admiral is already a leader in rural roads. And in fact, the convener of that talked to the people who are gonna be teaching the, the course. And they said, yeah, we use Apple models our go-to. Um, and so in this case, in this case tonight, I think that we might wanna be a bit more out of the box and do a few things that aren't being done by some of these more suburban counties and actually look to some cities and towns for um, some of that informing. I also say that when you have a neighborhood that has all the same setbacks, it can be look kind of boring. It's actually nice to not only vary the road curvature, but also to vary the the distances that you have for those yards. So um, I guess I'm the I'm not actually not an outlier. I'm an outlier of this memo a little bit, but not so much, I think, on this commission. Um, I wanted to bring up another uh, quick point that has kind of been touched on a bit in terms of you know, floor area ratio and, and thinking about lot coverage. Um, instead of being as concerned with uh, how far back a structure is from its sidewalk in a residential district, or even a commercial one for that matter, um, we could think about uh, for residential maximum lot coverage. Um, because we, we do see that um, happening a lot, you know, up in Fairfax County where people are just going you know, there's like nothing left of the yard. They're, they are building these, you know, 5,000, 6,000 square foot homes on in neighborhoods and they're just domineering over their, their neighbors and more, maybe even more importantly than that social dominance feeling is the fact that we are trying to deal with stormwater. And so, uh, you know, if you have a residential lot and you're just improving the size of your house, we don't have a stormwater utility fee that didn't go forward. Um, but we're trying to deal with all this stormwater runoff uh, and so we might want to be thinking about trying to preserve some green space. So maybe, you know, maximum lot coverage um, to your earlier point about, you know, people want to build different houses for different reasons. Somebody wants a small house and a big garden. Somebody wants a larger house so they can put their kid, uh, you know, after college in there in their home office and grandma and whatnot. Um, so I don't, I don't want to ramble on too much, but I guess, um, I, yeah, I would like to to not get rid of step backs. I would like it to be contextual to the, the where the building is. Um, the other thing is that I understand from staff that as we move through a rewrite of our zoning ordinance, we're gonna be looking at requiring massing uh, from the development community when we have uh, certain applications. Um, whereas right now we just have block blobs. Uh, and so it makes it hard for us to make judgments on, on the arrangement of those structures. So just, just something to think about. Um, but that is, that's mostly what I had. I did, I'm glad, I did have the same reaction you did to all the definitions. I, I do believe they should be condensed. Uh, I don't wanna be the source of confusion for anyone. Um, but yeah, I feel like that would be its own work session. You know? And uh, I was glad to see though, that you did pull out campgrounds versus camps because there's been a lot of confusion around whether this is something that people are sleeping overnight in or they're just going to have a picnic or you know, how long they're staying there, all of that. There are a lot of things like that in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and there are, um, even in our county, there are something, I only learned of this from my younger brother, some hip camps, you know yeah. about those? Yeah. It's like Airbnb except for camping. And there's a number of them where people are renting out their, the side of their river on a public road and people are paying to camp there and, you know, come in with their trailer and live there for three days, two weeks, a month. Um, and I think those are kind of going under the radar too. I don't think our, I don't think in the whole Airbnb, you know, uh, night, you know, lodging for hire type thing that we, 
even got to those, or I would venture to say perhaps Kind doesn't even know where they all are. Um, so. Hold on, the zoning administrator talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will go on a camp, camping exploration and find, no, I'm just kidding. But I, I do think that there, there are, um, th there's a definitely a need for addressing some of those uh, because they're sort of operating campsites with no zoning mm -hmm. um, and, and no tax collection as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so the other other concerns with this this document are whether we've confused the uh, consultants sufficiently or whether they, you know, are other things you wanted to add. Can I re give my yep. reserve bounce back? Yes. Um, just a couple of things just to, um, again, not restate what's already been stated, but one is the, under the heading of increasing the setbacks. Um, my eye went to light industrial and heavy industrial, just thinking about the the capacity that the county has and how careful we are to watch over that capacity because it's relatively limited. And the changes in the setbacks um, were pretty drastic to go from 10 to 30 and zero to 20 and so on. Um, so just thinking about uh, maybe the introduction there of the light industrial and the rationale behind why those uh, setbacks changed didn't really fully make a lot of sense to me. Um, because if you're concentrating your light industrial or heavy industrial and you know, a certain area, you probably want to make it as dense as possible with reason, you know, mm -hmm. with um, an understanding of proximities, I guess. Um, the second thing was, you know, this, this is, I think, going to become part of the comprehensive plan, right? So this will mm -hmm. part of the zoning ordinance. That's where the this zoning is, ordinance this will, this will be a, ultimately be a zoning text. Amendment. So this will be regulation. Right. So, Got it. so, um, well, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to tell you what the next steps are. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just thinking about sort of the forward thinking piece of this, right? I mean, this is sort of now a snapshot in time, in a sense, and we're looking at why. And I'm, I'm sure you're thinking 10, 15, 20 years down the road. But, you know, I'd be curious to know how these patterns of development that are being influenced with these setbacks are forward thinking um, and how that ties in. And then one last just curious question. If you have an adjacent landowner that is the same, so you have two adjoining landowners or the same landowner, has there been any thought given to any change to setbacks at adjoining common property lines? Historically, no, and that question has come up, and the answer has always been no, because there's nothing to prevent those properties from them being sold to two separate uh, individuals. Right. That makes sense. And so uh, treat them, and if you want to combine them or do a boundary line adjustment, combine them or do a boundary line adjustment to to alter where the buildings can go so that's been a consistent answer that makes sense great thank you i want to harken back to a conversation the planning commission had several years ago talking about crossroads communities and and thinking about um the number of sort of former general stores that are still sitting out there but they're not stores anymore uh, maybe someone's living in them you know, they've been, they're grandfathered out of their, they can't, they can't go back. Uh, and I'm, I actually think that there is perhaps on this planning commission, some interest in looking into opportunities for those to be re-upped if somebody wanted to create a little, you know, jam shop or something where tourists drive by and one car stops and picks up a, you know, a homemade bread and a, some jam and continues on. We, we, we have that book. Uh, yeah. that that list all the country stores that right. existed prior to and it's a pretty large book right. and we have the class a and the class b and while we're talking about going to a combined dis a combined definition we'll tweak the um supplemental regulations to to uh still have that that country store uh, we were we were talking about combining them this that was one we couldn't really do sorry um there were other ones the so they, there's the there's the class A and class B country stores, and then sort of a class C, whether or not there's gas involved. So actually, for those older ones that used to be, and they've changed their use, they be coming back as a country store class A is not that hard okay. to do. It's by right. Uh, we wrote it in such a way, I know we're getting off topic, but it's such a way that uh, to, to minimize the impact of, of VDOT regulations and parking regulations so that they can reopen without having to, um, you know, completely destroy the property or knock down or acquire additional property or knock down things. Okay. So yes, the country, that, that, that was work that was done to come up with the country store class A and class B. And similarly, for some, there are some rural churches that are sitting empty, 
and they don't have, they wouldn't meet modern standards for parking requirements. And so they, they cannot reopen. And I'm just curious about. We, we also that. changed the, we also changed the um, uh, religious assembly area uh, based on uh, the, the, um, our lupa regulations and the and the agricultural limits for mm -hmm. farm wineries people don't think they're related but in fact they are if you allow assembly of 200 people at a winery you have to allow assembly of 200 people for religious and if you're not regulating the winery the winery assembly you can't regulate the 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 the, the, the religious assembly so those small um places out there they can they they can reestablish. They can. They can even okay. expand in a lot of cases. And all they need is a building permit. Uh, same thing. Yeah. It's. It's. We have, we've had a number of them done. Okay. Thank you. Their comments or direction. Yeah. Yeah. Just really a general comment. I mean, this could apply to this to the setback versus um, step back or, or some other uh, factors that we've talked about. And, and that is thinking about providing mitigation options. So instead of just switching one. So I think, I think one of the options for the setback was to get rid of the, of the step back and then create more setback. So instead of switching one for one is provide mitigation options where they can do potentially several things uh, to mitigate the issue. But first we've got to address what the issue is, right? And that's why I think the context is important. What is it that we're trying to address with some of these changes? And then are there ways that you can build in flexibility? So if someone wanted to, instead of uh, the step back, they wanted to create more setbacks, or perhaps they could provide landscape that mitigates the height. Uh, so there's some things in it. And I, I think um, uh, Chair Firehawk, um, my recollection is the same, that those, those exceptions were all because one, some of them had significant setbacks and we didn't think it was an issue right. um, uh, with, with the height. So, so I, I Perhaps thinking about it, those terms, instead of just mm -hmm. switching one regulation for another, they all have some significant unintended consequences, I think, where if we can provide, provide some variety or options, uh, we'll have a richer uh, uh, built environment. That's helpful. Um, if, if I could just turn to my team and make sure that we're getting everything that they need. Um, are you going to tell me what those three Charles, words are? Bart, we all just wanted to make sure they didn't have any questions also. This has been very helpful. I, I'm so, so when I, well, just before you before you sort of move on, and you can just whisper what those three new replacement words were at the end of when, you, when we have a break, so that I know what the editorial piece on there. So, but I will recall when we were doing the form based code, and we were particularly looking at the opportunity that was going to occur, perhaps up twenty nine, where the idle, 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 whatever the idle. Thank you. Where that is, that we had a lot of discussion about about how to create place with both, I remember Rachel taking us through both setbacks and step backs and, 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 and looking at how, I, I know one of our, 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 our previous um, commissioners was trying to get a sense of what would the view from up there and not being able to sort of both have that, that interesting place but also have a place that took that, that that took advantage of our of our topography, and so this is to go. I think what Luis is saying is that as we're doing this, while many of the many of the um, communities that you reference here are, are sort of what I call flatland flat, flatland places. There's a couple that have some sort of rolling hills on them. Very few of them of these have the sort of backdrop of those Western mountains or even the Eastern mountains over there by uh, coming as you come down 20, come up 20 and they were there. And so thinking about what is, what is sort of the, the set, sort of the visual set that we're trying to sort of create, create this, 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 this new place of being or to continue. And then that's, that would be, I think, helpful for me and it probably would be helpful for developers as they can envision how they're going to place that piece of construction in this particular location. Yeah, we did spend a lot of time on right. that with Ryle yeah. talking about being able to see through so that you could, you wouldn't have just when you were in that development, just be surrounded by buildings and not be able to see the mountains or the air and light. Um, you know, you said it's you know, the view, view sets, sets, and I think, that's, I think that's the question. Like, we have so much 
you know, when you go up to Rio in 29, it yeah. naturally sits higher. And so you can see a lot of things and being able to make a sense of something's a little bit lower and I don't have to give quite the big setback, but then trade off to have a step back that gives a view of the mountains now from a different elevation place. That'd be a good trade off to have to maintain our view sheds. If we eliminate step backs and max, max you know, increase the setbacks, we lose some of that flexibility, but that those are, and then in general, I think that's, we've already said it and not to beat it. You've said it in what I was trying to get to much more eloquently is that we are creating this urban ring. And so, but our, we're distinctively Albemarle right. urban ring. We're not a 12 story or whatever. And so what does that mean to us and how should that be provided for in this so that we can facilitate the rail based form based code and crozet and stuff like that, which is a, a different, a different fill. Yeah. Thank you. That was very helpful. And I would I just add, you know, I know the art of writing code, you have to be very precise, as precise as you possibly can be. But again, one of the uh, exceptions that we granted was due to the fact that a building was actually slightly downslope, so that the view from the street was not of a four story building, it was more of a three story building. So taking topography into context, there. I think there is an artful way you could put into code uh, air, air, situations in which uh, exceptions could be granted or, you know, that just so that we get at that topography question. Because we are not a flat pancake. <laughs> flatlanders, flatlanders, we're not flatlanders. <laughs> All right, so I think, I think it's not illegal for us to end two minutes early of our meeting unless anyone else would like to make a, Final closing comment, gentlemen, do you have anything to add to the discussion? I, I will say that one of the reasons there's lots of ink is because I can read it. And so I will actually spend time with the document if I can sort of move through it. And, you know, and so any document that has, any document on my desk that has one or two marks, it's because I said, I'm not gonna pay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna invest in this because this is too painful. I don't need to do that anymore. I'd just say, I, I think I launched into questions earlier. I just, I do want to say thank you to Seth. This is a hard problem and thank them and, and, and all that. So we, we recognize this isn't as easy and I hope my comments weren't taken as, as beating you up too bad. Just, no, we, we understand this is hard and, and we sit on the side of the dais that gets confused often. I would, I would say that um, it, when we get this back, when you've had time to wrestle with all of this, I would like to ask that we could have at least two weeks to go through it because um, I personally have been out of town on business and you know reading this on the airplane, reading this in the airport lounge. Uh, you know, we, we need more time, especially if we want to ask you questions um, ahead of time, ahead of the meeting, so that you can you know answer those context questions or reference questions. You can do that. Okay. These are very helpful. I don't know how I'm going to answer some of these questions, but they're <laughs> but they're helpful. Thank you. Well, we didn't quite get to the meaning of life, but almost. <laughs> well, so, pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> or, what's a, or what's a mini thank storage versus Thank you, storage. Mr. Fritz. And thank you guys for all of your hard work. And reading code is is not fun, but we appreciate your work. It's geek work. If, you, if that's what you are. <laughs> some people, I guess some people think it's fun yeah, to read code. All right. I'm going to call this meeting of the Albemarle County Planning Commission to a close. We will uh, reconvene in one hour this evening in the same location.